Well, if you're a mom and this is your first time to be here at Garden City Fellowship Church, we love you and thank you for choosing to be with us today. It's great to have you and also if you're watching online here at Garden City Fellowship, we are celebrating Mother's Day and uh, we want to wish you as well a happy Mother's Day too and thank you for tuning into our live stream and just being part of our church family. We bless you, we pray for you and uh, not just that actually we have one person who has come and joined us just because they've been watching live stream and uh, we're so blessed to have you. Thank you so much and it's good to have people. So if you're watching online and you want to come and join us in person, we invite you as well. Our family, Garden City fa family, is actually big. Uh, at the moment, our Facebook followers are almost about 1,600 people uh, on our Facebook page who follow our page. So that's a huge family. I was checking actually from which countries we do have people who are following our page. We have from Australia, Africa, Philippines, Pakistan, India, and so many other places. So that just tells you the power of... Uh, digital uh, uh, reaching out and evangelism and uh, just extending to the whole world. As you know that uh, we've been here in this church uh, uh, following one series and last week Janice, she did such a fabulous job as she started that series uh, titled, I hope you can read that. Um, if, if you have special skills of reading writing like this. There's a message in there I'll be sharing, uh, I'll be talking about this in, in, in a minute, but let's pray before we make a start. Father, we thank you that we can come to you because you are mighty. You are our creator. You are our provider, you are our sustainer, and you are our hope. That's why we turn to you. This is your moment. This is your time to speak to your people. Bless us through your word. Help us through your spirit to understand it. Prepare our hearts, ears, and mind to receive you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you look at this picture, it's, it's, it's really actually a very interesting picture. Um, I don't know if you... If you have noticed this, this writing, actually last night, Alan, he texted me and he said, how do you say this word? It's almost like ipo, gnisach, or gniska. I said, no, 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 Alan, that's not what it is. The word is chasing hope. But the picture is flipped over. You know, if you have a picture flipped on the other side, you will have the real clear word, chasing hope. But there is a reason why this picture is flipped over. When I was looking at the meaning of the word flipped over, in English it has a number of synonyms. One of them is overturned, or tipped over, or upset, or upturned. So how exactly one can still hold on to hope when their life is flipped over? When their family circumstances are upside down? When everything is, is, is turned upside down or tipped over, how can you still chase hope when you're dealing with circumstances such as that? That's the reason you have this picture flipped over because people who chase hope are usually the one who are dealing with hopeless situation and circumstances. Whose life is turned upside down and flipped over. So right now, while you're sitting in this church, is your life overturned? by a tragedy? 
Is your life tipped over through financial crisis or is your life upturned through family issues? What are you dealing with this morning as you're sitting right here in God's presence? As you know, today we celebrate Mother's Day here at Garden City Fellowship. And I thought it's worth noticing one mother in the Bible who fittingly dealt with this theme. She chased hope in times and circumstances that was very challenging for her. We are going to look at one lady who is not mentioned a lot in the Bible, but she gave birth to one man who turned out to be the legendary leader in the history of Israel, and her name is Jochebed. To build a little bit of historical context, we will go back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis chapter 37, we come to know that Joseph, one of Jacob's son, is sold into slavery and he ends up in Egypt. And while he is in Egypt, later on, his entire family, due to famine, comes to Egypt and they also settle there. When we look at about Genesis chapter 46, we come to know that there were only about 69 people of blood relation with Jacob who ended up in Egypt. 69 people who had blood relations with Jacob. But later on, as we come to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, and two, and so on, we come to know that when Israelites, they left Egypt, they were about 600,000 men on foot, excluding children. They grew into a great nation. They, when they entered into Egypt, they were very small in number, but when they left Egypt, you're dealing with a big number of people. So it took them about 215 to 430 years within Egypt to grow into that number. So here's the one passage, Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. It talks about one man. His name was Amram. Let's look at this passage. Now Amram took for himself Jochebed, his father's sister, as wife. And she bore him Aaron and Moses, and of course, we also know Miriam. And the years of the life of Amram were 137. So Amram lived only about 137 years, so it looks like Amram, Jochebed, Miriam, Moses, Aaron, they were all born in Egypt. Let me have a look at the family tree just for you to understand the family dynamics. We've got Kohath. Kohath was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Jacob. Levi was part of 12 tribes, right? And from Kohath, you have another son whose name is Amram. Jochebed was actually the sister of Kohath. In today's terms, you would call her aunt of Amram. All right? So Amram married his aunt. Or Jochebed married her nephew. That's the relationship dynamic right there. So we know that she was a daughter of Levi, Jochebed. She was born in Egypt. She was married to Amram, her nephew. They most likely had a huge age gap. But it appears things did work out for them, and they had the most amazing marriage, and they ended up having three well-known children, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. All of them were born in Egypt. Like in the land of Goshen, we'll have a map, uh, Apollonia, right there. 
people look at that map, it's a bit small for you, but on the screen you can see it clearly. So they settled in the land of Goshen, you'll see on my left here, and that's where most likely they were born, all of them. So let's quickly jump, after building a, a bit of historical context, jump into, jump into the book of Exodus and pick up the story of Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. That's where we will pick the story from. I'll have the text here, so I'll, let's just have a scripture reading first. Now there arose a king, a new king over Egypt. You remember Joseph was quite influential in the political world in Egypt, but when Joseph grew old and he died later on, there was a new king who didn't really know Joseph, and this is what started happening. So there, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal surely with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So Egyptians, they started afflicting Israel or Israelites. And the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and they grew in number. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all the service in which they made them serve with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. So he couldn't deal with them in that manner. He came up with another strategy. And he, this is what he said to the midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Verse 17, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the, for, for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. For they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt, with, uh, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, so he started from first strategy, and then he came to the second strategy of using midwives. That didn't work. Now Pharaoh is coming to his third strategy in verse 22. And he said to all his people, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river. So he told all the Egyptians, If you see any son that is born within Israelites, just get hold of him, throw him into the river Nile. And every daughter you shall save her. Now let's for a moment consider the circumstances. That's the Bible passage that we are looking at. And I want us to just for a moment pause and consider Jochebed's circumstances. You know, usually we say that Bible in the Bible people had easy life. No, they didn't. Jochebed, she didn't have easy life. For a moment, I want you to consider her circumstances. She was born in slavery. She was married to her nephew. I don't know if she had a choice to marry someone else, but she ended up marrying her nephew. She perhaps had a 
good number of years age gap between her husband and her, and she had to live with a husband who perhaps wasn't as mature as she was. So Amram perhaps was not as mature in wisdom as Jochebed was. Usually ladies, they are you know, more mature in wisdom. I, I must accept that. <laughs> I must accept that. <laughs> so she lived under the Egyptian taskmasters who afflicted them with the burdens. So she was a slave, literally. Most likely she was involved in building supply cities of Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh as well. And I'm pretty sure she was also involved in making bricks and, uh, and uh, building and serving in the fields as well as a slave. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi, so the woman conceived. And these are the circumstances. She's a slave. She's working as a slave. The context is that the king has already commanded that if any woman gives birth to a son, that son needs to be thrown into a river. Now, I want you to imagine as, as a woman, as a mother, that uh, you know, you, you're, you've conceived and you're going through your nine-month period. I wonder how you're going to deal with this circumstance that at the end of your pregnancy, when you deliver your child, if you end up having a child who is male child, that male child is going to be thrown into a Nile River. I wonder how you will survive your pregnancy for nine months, that knowing that at the end of it, if I've got a son, he's going to be killed. I wonder how you would deal with this fact or uncertainty that you really don't know whether you're going to have a son or daughter. I mean, perhaps if you knew that you're going to have a daughter, you may have the smooth journey of nine months. They're okay, that's all right. I've got, I'm going to have a daughter. King has already said daughters will live, so it's going to be all right. Miriam was already there before Moses was born. So that is why perhaps Miriam, was, she grew up and she was a big sister to Moses. So how do you deal with circumstances such as these? When, when you are dealing with uncertainty, you don't know what's going to happen next day, what's going to happen in a month's time, what's going to happen in nine months' time. How did Jacob deal with this? Exodus, let's now go to verse 15 to 16 and 22. What, this is what actually the king said. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the other one Pua. And he said to them, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, leave her alone. So Pharaoh commanded all his people as well, that if they see any son who is born in Israel family, just get this son, throw them into a river Nile. As I've said already, moms, imagine yourself in Jacob's position, in Jacob's place. It wasn't easy for her. I wish God would have made her life easy, but I really wonder why he didn't. God could have simply taken Jacob and Amram out of Egypt and sent them to Canaan where there was no such threat. But they stayed in Egypt. Even knowing the fact that after Jacob has given birth, they didn't know what the future will be for their child. There is nothing more painful in this world for a parent to know that they are not certain, they can't really be sure of the future of their children. There's nothing painful in this world for a mom to see their child suffer, to see their child in pain. I wonder how Jacob had dealt with the fact that one day her son will be taken away. How did she deal with such pain? How did she keep on clinging to hope? How did she keep on chasing hope even when she was in the middle of circumstances that were hopeless? How did she deal with all of that? 
In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, this is what it says. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How can you be joyful when you're going through tough times in your life? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. For Jacobet, things got worse before they got better. And when things get worse, it's very, ha very hard to imagine that one day things will get better. It's not easy. When you're navigating through those dark moments in your life, you wake up every day thinking, hopefully this day is going to be a different day, hoping that this day will bring healing, hoping that this day will bring hope. You keep on chasing hope day to day, moment to moment, hour by hour, year by year. And perhaps that's how Jochebed, she lived through nine months of pregnancy, praying that, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen with this child, but I do trust in you. I'll keep on chasing hope. I, I'll keep on trusting in you. I'll keep on hanging on to you. I'll keep on clinging on to you because you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are my foundation. You are my rock upon which I can stand in the times when it gets dark and hopeless. She did that. When you go to Exodus chapter 2, I don't have a time to really read through the whole passage. But we, I will tell you the story how it all unfolded. So for nine months, she was pregnant. Finally, she gave birth to Moses, male child. Decree has already been offered or ordered by Pharaoh that if there is a male child, that male child needs to be thrown into a river Nile or killed. Now the day has come. She has given birth. And for three months, Jochebed, as a mom, managed to hide Moses from other people. For three months, she nursed him, she raised him, praying every day, clinging on to the hope, hoping that God will make a way. She kept on chasing hope. She kept on running towards God. She kept on praying. But after three months, what happened that she couldn't really hold the child in any longer. If the child would cry or, you know, usually by three months, children, they start moving around or some kids, they start crawling as well. And it wasn't easy at all for, him, for her to keep that child hidden away from the people. Now, while she is in those three months, she, she is raising him, she is praying, she is also doing another thing, and that is she is building a small little ark that was built out of bulrushes. So she's making that, and then she's also having, uh, she's, dubbed, she's dubbing it with the asphalt and pitch. It's, it's some, some sort of a material that she's uh, using to plaster it from outer, outer side. So when she puts this into river, it won't sink. I want you to just imagine for a moment that while she's doing that, she's building this small mini ark. By the way, in Hebrew, it's the same word that is used for Noah's ark and this ark that she's building. It's the same Hebrew word that is used. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, God used that ark to save Noah and his family and it's very interesting what's happening here as Jochebed is building this mini ark. And in that ark, she's going to place her son while chasing hope, while trusting that God will come through for her. So she places her son in that ark. 
Imagine if you were there witnessing what was going on, just watching her face. I wonder if she was crying. I wonder she, if she was uh, happy. I wonder, but looking at that, she is giving away her son. She doesn't know what the future holds for her. I'm pretty sure she must have been crying. It's not easy for moms when they see their children in pain. And for Jochebed, I'm pretty sure it wasn't easy because she is going to give away her son. It's not that, that she is seeing her son in pain, but she is actually going to give him away. Not into human hands, but place him in the reeds by the, uh, in, at the bank of River Nile. That's where she's going to place him, not knowing what's going to happen. So, she talks to her daughter, Miriam, who was old enough at that time to, to go out. And as they place this child in that river, in the middle of those reeds, Miriam, she is standing a little afar, watching what's going to happen. As Jochebed goes away, Miriam stays. She just can't go away from her brother. And while Miriam is watching right at that time, I, I, that's something that's fascinating for me in the Bible, that right at that time, Pharaoh's daughter and her friends, they come out to somewhat similar place where this ark is placed. In the reeds. They came, Egyptian ladies, they would come in a time when there are not too many people and they would bath in River Nile. So they come, and as they are walking around, Pharaoh's daughter, she looks and then she sees this ark is in the middle of these reeds. And she sends one of her mates that made picks up the ark, she brings this ark to Pharaoh's daughter, and as she opens, she looks at this beautiful son, and as she's looking at Moses face to face, right at that moment, Moses cries. That's what it says in the Bible. You know, you've watched movies where actually she heard the cry, and that's how they go and look at the ark. That's not in the Bible. In the Bible, it says they saw the ark. Ark was brought to her. She opened the ark, and she looked at the face, and that's when Moses cried. And right after that, it says in the Bible that she had compassion on him. Look at what it says in the Bible. Look at what it says in the Bible. We're looking at Exodus chapter 2, verse 5. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bath at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him. I'm just thinking, the thing that boggles my mind is, how God is orchestrating everything. Timing, people. Why is it that right at that time you didn't get an Egyptian soldier coming around and looking at this ark? Why is it that you only have Pharaoh's daughter? And by the way, Pharaoh's daughter had two brothers who had already died. So there was only father and daughter who were ruling over Egypt. So there was no heir for Egyptian family who was going to take over after Pharaoh had passed away. Actually, historically speaking, the daughter who picked Moses ended up after the death of her father ruling over Egypt. And she was hoping that Moses would be the one who may rule over Egypt after her. The timing of God how God orchestrated everything, people. On one hand, you have a mother who raised her child for three months. Now she has to give away. On the other hand, you have a woman who have lost two brothers, and she doesn't have any child. 
she was still single. And God is going to give her a hope for Egypt. So on one hand, you have a lady who worships the living and true God. On the other hand, you have Egyptian women who worships many gods. But in the middle of this, there is a living God who's going to meet the needs of both ladies. On one hand, this mom, when she gave away this child, she placed him in the reeds, thinking that she's lost him. God is going to return this child back to her. On the other hand, God is going to give hope to this woman who appears to be very kind and compassionate at heart. How God could meet the needs of both? How God, what happens next is when Miriam sees that, okay, Pharaoh's daughter has got the child, she comes running to her and she asks her, when she realizes that they're not really harsh towards the child, she asks, should I get someone who can nurse this child? Then it says in the Bible that Pharaoh's daughter said to her maiden, by the way, Pharaoh's daughter said to Miriam, go. And then later on in the Bible it says that maiden got child's mother, whose name was what? Jochebed, to come and get Moses back. I don't think, I just, when I was preparing this message, I was just thinking, how can you do this, God? At one moment, you almost made Jochebed feel like that her world is falling apart. At one moment, you almost made Jochebed feel that she's going to lose Moses once for all. And the next moment, you give Moses back to Jochebed. And not just that, Pharaoh's daughter said, I will pay you to raise this child. How could you do that, God? That before Jochebed was even worried and scared raising this child because she knew that somebody, if they find it, they will kill him. Now, God has turned things around and she has nothing to fear. But in addition to that, God has said, I'm going to give you money to take care of this child. When God intervenes, things happen that you have never even imagined. When God steps in, he will turn your life upside down. When you journey with him, it may appear dark. He can turn your darkness into light just like that. He's able to do that. He did that for Jochebed. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, it says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God cares for his people. There's another passage, Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. What sort of circumstance are you dealing with right now? Is it something that you think, man, when will I find a way out of this? Will it ever change for me? Is it a family situation you are in? Is it your personal, maybe within your marriage, you are finding some of those challenges. And then each day, it's like you're chasing hope. You're running after hope. You're wanting to get hold of something that will give you something to hold on to or that will give you some sort of glimpse of light or something that, hey, it's going to be all right. It's going to be fine. You'll be just fine. Well, today, Jacob's story it shows us that God can change things for his people. He can turn things around. I have this beautiful quote, and I'm going to wrap that up quickly. 
with that. It says here as uh, angels were, yes, that's the, that's the right quote. It says, angels were also watching that no harm should come to the helpless infant. That's talking about Moses, which had been placed there by an affectionate mother and committed to the care of God by her earnest prayers mingled with tears. And these angels directed the footsteps of Pharaoh's daughter to the river. Who directed the footsteps? Angels. Near the very spot where lay the innocent little stranger. Another quote. Can, can we have the other one? Jochebed was a woman and a slave. Her lot in life was humble. Her burden heavy, but through no other woman. Take note of these words. Through no other woman save Mary of Nazareth has the world received greater blessing, knowing that her child must soon pass beyond her care to the guardianship of those who know not God. She the more earnestly endeavored to link his soul with heaven. She sought to implant in his heart love and loyalty to God, and faithfully was the work accomplished. Those principles of truth that were the burden of his mother's teaching and the lesson of her life, no after influence could induce Moses to renounce. Chokabed, amazing mother, strong, resilient mother. Despite challenges, despite hopelessness, she kept on chasing hope. And God blessed her with a son who was none other than Moses. God used Moses later on to redeem Israelites out of Egypt. God used Moses later on to give Torah, to give commandments. God communed with Moses face to face. In the book of Genesis, God saved Noah to save humanity through the earth. In the book of Exodus, God saved Moses through that earth. And through Moses, he saved the entire nation of Israel, offered them redemption. And later on, this story was to become an everlasting example of God's victory over sin and captivity. In the entire New Testament, Writers, they use this example, just as God redeemed Israelites out of captivity, God can redeem each one of us from the captivity of sin, from the slavery of sin. What a wonderful story of hope. But Jochebed had to let go before God could step in. She had to let go her son, and then later on God brought her son back. By the way, she had to do that twice before she placed him in the reeds, and then later on she had to give, it, give him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he lived in palace. Twice she gave him away. What a strong lady. So would you choose, choose this morning to chase hope like Jochebed? That's, that's my plea to you. Would you like to do that? As moms... If you are sitting here and dealing with some tough challenges as you're parenting, I have a high respect for my wife. She, we are raising our son who has few health issues. And it's not easy, I can tell you. But she's holding on to. And, and she at, at times actually encourages me as well. Will you keep on chasing hope this morning? Will you keep on clinging to God? God can do the same for us, by the way, just as he did for Jochebed. He can bring people in our lives. He can bring amazing people who can help us, who can give us hope and strength and energy to keep on moving forward. Let's pray. Father, I just wanted to bring each mom present here into your care and presence. I'm pretty sure it's not easy. Raising our children, that's one of the most difficult and challenging job. So I just pray, just like Jochebed, you stepped into her life and you turned it upside down. And you brought hope 
and blessings in our life. I pray for each mom present here. May you bless them too with the strength and energy and resilience and uh, hope and positivity that can help them keep on raising their children despite the challenges and, and trying times. I place each mom into your care, Lord, here. And others as well who are dealing with difficult times. It's just wonderful to see how when you step into any situation, how you can turn it around and turn it as a blessing, not just for one, but for many. I pray that for each mom present here, that may happen. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.